going live. Okay, I think we are live. All right. Welcome everybody to today's 3DGV talk. Uh, today we have Kostas Danielidis, uh, uh, a professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, who is doing a lot of interesting work on human going live body pose. Oh, sorry, you gave me a Okay, say. I think we are live. Okay, all right. Got all that. right. Oops. Welcome everybody to today's 3DGV talk. All right. Okay. Lots of, okay. Okay. All right. So today we have Kostas giving us a talk about 3D human and bird poses. And for our panelists, we have Sylvia Zuffi uh, from uh, 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 Sylvia, sorry, I, the um, I say Imati, CNR, CNR, CNR Imati, sorry, CNR Imati, and Jimmy Yang from Adobe Research. Uh, and Sylvia is an expert on animal and human body, human pose, human uh, research. And Jimmy is also doing a lot of exciting things in human body. So the discussion should be fun. All right. Uh, thank you, Costas. Please take it away. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I thank the organizers and also Anju for introducing and uh, Sylvia and uh, Jimmy for uh, leading the panel later. Uh, I will talk about uh, 3D human pose and uh, uh, also 3D bird uh, pose and shape. Um, this is work uh, with uh, Nikos uh, Koloturos, Georgios Pavlakos, uh, Yufu Wang and Mark uh, Badger. Uh, now, several other people are in my group. My group is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, big, and uh, uh, I have here a picture of all the current members and the recent uh, alumni. And uh, some of them have also contributed uh, to this work, as well as many other papers I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk about uh, today. So uh, just a brief overview of uh, my interests. Uh, I uh, am really uh, passionate about geometry, which I'm gonna talk today, uh, both for reconstruction uh, as well as uh, uh, the equivariance properties uh, of uh, uh, deep learning approaches. But uh, we also do a lot of research on neuromorphic sensing, like the video you see here on the upper right on computing optical flow and as well as on uh, robots uh, and uh, prediction of their actions and uh, really how to implement curiosity in robotics. So, uh, but I will, this, uh, the talk is only one hour. It is about geometry. So I'm gonna concentrate uh, just on uh, 3D human and uh, bird uh, reconstruction. So, uh, what we really want is uh, given uh, an image or a sequence uh, of images to be able to produce this uh, 3D human message for uh, uh, 3D message for humans uh, and uh, as well as uh, for uh, birds. Uh, the second one uh, is quite uh, also exciting, not only for general application as it is, we know that uh, the 3D human reconstruction is a very hot topic. Uh, the second one, the birds, is really for the purpose of uh, helping uh, scientists, biologists, and neuroscientists. So let's start about with the humans. So uh, given a single RGB image, uh, we really want to compute uh, the human pose, really the posture of the human, uh, as well as uh, the shape uh, in the form of a 3D mesh. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this you see that uh, this problem is quite uh, challenging. Uh, it's because we just have uh, 2D information. As a matter of fact, we have uh, really RGBs on pixels, and uh, we want to get uh, the XYZ positions of the body joints in space, as you see here on the right, uh, as well as the, a full uh, uh, body mesh that, uh, as much as possible, uh, represents uh, the body of the person. So I'm going to focus my talk in uh, two most fundamental families of methods for solving the 3D pose reconstruction problem at the beginning. 
uh, as an optimization problem. And uh, later we're gonna go into the main uh, focus of my talk, uh, which is uh, the probabilistic approaches and how really to embrace uh, uh, uncertainty and ambiguity in geometric problems. So let's start uh, from uh, the very, very basics. Uh, this is the foundation model of uh, human. Uh, people talk about foundation models these days, uh, and this is the foundation model for the 3D humans, uh, uh, the model that uh, made uh, really uh, things uh, much simpler for all of us. Uh, SMPL is a parametric uh, model of the human body that defines a mapping from a set of uh, pose and uh, shape parameters to a body mesh with uh, 6,890 uh, 6, vertices. Quite low dimensional, they are just uh, 10. And we have uh, 72 parameters for the actual like uh, posture of the human. So the very first paradigm, and uh, that is uh, for everybody who's coming from the uh, geometry uh, background like me, this was probably the most natural thing to do first. If you have a parametric model, you try to apply an optimization, whether it is uh, earlier in structure for motion problem or uh, here uh, in uh, the reconstructing uh, uh, a human from a single frame. So you can, of course, you need a transition from the pixels uh, to uh, our uh, geometric entities. And for that, we uh, extract silhouettes. Uh, we might do a part segmentation or uh, detect uh, two-dimensional key points. And uh, deep learning has been uh, extremely good on uh, doing uh, all this. So then uh, this uh, brought also a revolution on us geometers on how to do this transition from uh, uh, images uh, to the third dimension. Then the optimization objective uh, usually is uh, to take the object and try to align it uh, as best as possible with uh, the silhouette. If you have part annotation also with the parts and uh, also on the mesh, you have uh, an one-to-one -one, uh, uh, computation from the mesh to the key points and you can align it to the 2D key points in space. Unfortunately, this original uh, uh, iterative uh, fitting procedure can be uh, very slow, uh, as you see here on the several stages of the reconstruction, and is prone uh, to failure when uh, the 2D features might have mistakes. Uh, and uh, it is uh, difficult to deal with uh, uh, reconstruction uh, ambiguities and uh, this is very common in geometric problems, uh, starting uh, not only on the one, uh, uh, not only on the single view, even in structural motion, uh, you might have uh, critical ambiguity, several solutions, and you need an approach uh, where uh, you really need to embrace these ambiguities. So the second approach that uh, came together with uh, deep learning is uh, really to build a network which will predict all these parameters. So in this case, uh, it is uh, uh, the output of the prediction uh, is the post parameter theta and the shape parameters beta again from the same from the SMPL model. And uh, we can reconstruct uh, uh, this uh, model based on these parameters. And uh, in the really plain regression, we might have a ground truth for the theta and beta and really directly uh, minimize uh, the discrepancy between the ground truth and the predicted parameters. But uh, it's very difficult uh, to really find such ground truth for images. Uh, we might have uh, uh, data sets like the 3.6 million uh, where we have this ground truth, but for the majority of the images, uh, there is absolutely no ground truth in uh, 3D. So what uh, we ideally want uh, is uh, to take advantage of uh, 2D annotations that exist in abundance. Uh, they can be masks, they can be key points or semantic uh, parts. And uh, this is what uh, uh, we end up doing with a 
regression-based approaches, like in the HMR approach, uh, which is an end-to-end -end recovery of human shape and pose. Given an image containing a person, uh, we first encode it into a feature vector. Uh, then uh, this feature vector is used to predict uh, uh, both the global camera pose, like scale, rotation, translation, the beta shape parameters, and the theta uh, pose parameters. And uh, for uh, the images where uh, we don't have uh, as, uh, theta and beta notation, like 3D ground truth, we reproject. And because we have a lot of reprojected data, we try to minimize the discrepancy of the reprojection. And uh, then uh, we have, uh, we might uh, want to penalize uh, improbable poses with a discriminator, uh, which uh, really uh, discriminates between uh, real and uh, like wrong uh, or fake uh, humans. And uh, we can include also an adversarial uh, prior. Uh, and uh, this for the real or, or or fake humans, we can use uh, like prior shape data from a uh, mock-up uh, data set. So the question uh, based, and this is really one of the standard uh, frameworks, uh, the state of the art these days. And the question is if we can push this uh, accuracy even further. And uh, can we make better use of the frames that are actually uh, annotated? Uh, and uh, one uh, uh, key observation, is that often the regression results do not align well with, this, with the image. Uh, this is expected because of the form of the output space. It's particularly hard to predict all joint angles correctly in a single shot. And uh, on the other hand, when we use the optimization, the very basic uh, uh, single optimization, if it is successful, then uh, we get a, a very good uh, image to model alignment. And uh, optimization was really the main uh, uh, tool we were using in uh, geometric problems uh, for uh, many decades. Uh, we used it in battle adjustment, uh, we use it in uh, uh, PNP and many, many other problems. And I was always thinking when we started doing uh, deep learning in geometry, why we just uh, uh, don't uh, use uh, more optimization as part of the pipeline. And uh, this is indeed uh, what uh, we ended up uh, doing, uh, like a synergy between uh, a regression and an optimization. So the way it uh, works is the following. Optimization methods provide uh, image alignment uh, uh, that uh, can uh, really supervise the regression network. And on the other hand, the regression network can provide very good initializations for the optimization procedure because uh, optimi these optimizers optimize non-convex functions. So they are really very, very sensitive to the initialization. So we have this really tight uh, loop where uh, we can initialize, we can predict something, we can initialize the optimizer, and then we can use uh, the result of the optimizer as a ground truth on our regression. So this uh, ended up uh, uh, to the approach called SPIN, uh, which we published in uh, ICSV 2019, where SMP, uh, this is the simple model optimization in the loop, where uh, we first regress a shape, then we apply a simplified optimization, uh, which uh, we fit uh, on the 2D joints. And then we take this uh, optimized shape, and uh, we minimize, uh, we use it as a, pretty much as a ground truth to minimize uh, the uh, difference uh, between the output of the model optimization and the output of the regression. And here is another example with a different image. Again, we uh, have some initial values for the, from the regression for the whole body and shape. We do the optimization using just the two D joints we get a 3D shape and we use this as a loss. And all of this is in one pipeline. And uh, I really had a huge relief after that because I, I, I was thinking we have solved so many problems with optimization and geometry, uh, state of the art uh, pretty much in uh, multiple uses bundle adjustment. Why don't apply such a, a scheme really here? 
And uh, I think uh, with uh, the spin, we achieved also pretty much the, sp the state of the art results. Uh, and uh, uh, we al also have the best marriage between uh, 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 network regression and classic uh, optimization. So uh, better to summarize it really, better networks estimates can lead to optimization with better solutions because of the initialization and more accurate fits like the optimization, which fits better to the 2D, provide better su uh, supervision of the network. So we have here several results uh, on the 3DPW dataset. And I list uh, here uh, the state of the art in uh, reconstruction error, uh, which is, uh, we have, uh, uh, this is the spin. And uh, starting with the HMR, the HMMR, and two other approaches, including uh, the mesh uh, reconstruction using a graph-based approach from uh, Nikos Kolotouros, who is also the first author here. All right, so this is the, uh, 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 we talk about uh, optimization, pure optimization, we talked about regression, and we talked about the best marriage of the two. And uh, still the optimization, as we all know in geometric problems, it always gives just one solution. And the, uh, the, it remains uh, as an open question how really to tackle with uh, all these ambiguities which uh, uh, exist in, uh, inherently in uh, single images. And uh, this might be because of lack of information, like in truncated images uh, or uh, in occlusions, but it might be also just because of uh, depth ambiguities, uh, the way they exist in classic uh, geometric uh, problems where uh, we have a pretty much uh, uh, all the points uh, present and such ambiguities, as you know, exist in already like in PNP or structure from motion. And uh, even more when you have just a single image. So uh, people started tackling this uh, uh, problem. This is from the NeurIPS paper uh, from the Daltis group. And uh, in this approach, uh, in order to deal with ambiguities, uh, you tell your network to really create uh, uh, not uh, one prediction, but really M predictions. Uh, this is a fixed number of uh, predictions. And uh, uh, you can uh, then apply the HMR uh, pipeline and you get uh, several hypotheses. And then uh, you cluster the results of the, this hypothesis uh, based uh, on uh, their discrepancy to the reprojection error with respect to the to the key points. And uh, the problem with this uh, approach is that uh, there is no way to compute the likelihood of a given pose. Uh, you just get uh, a fixed number of hypotheses. And uh, the second one is that uh, the, your network is uh, really increasing linearly with the number of hypotheses because you have to run the whole HMR for every single hypothesis prediction. So starting from this, we uh, thought about how uh, is it possible to produce a full probability distribution, a full uh, like uh, conditional of the probability of the pose that we're gonna get uh, given an image. And uh, this led to uh, the new approach. Uh, we call it PRO-HMR, uh, which we just made public yesterday. And uh, it will appear at ICCB 2021. And uh, I have also my, uh, our new colleague, uh, Dinesh Chayaraman, uh, as a, a faculty collaborator. And this is worked by Nikos and uh, Georgius. So, we start with a classic uh, pipeline where uh, we first uh, have an encoder. And what we really want from this encoder is uh, to produce a probability distribution of uh, every uh, possible uh, shape in the image. And we demonstrate uh, this probability distribution in a very nice way here, uh, where uh, uh, you see that uh, the side view 
in all these four images is uh, quite like similar and fitting to the 2D. Pretty much uh, all of these probably minimize the reprojection loss. But uh, if you look at the uh, uh, at, from a different view, like orthogonal view, then you see that uh, there are several options for the depth. This is not an occlusion problem here, but there is also several options for the depth to really satisfy this uh, 2D consistency. And uh, <clears throat> so what uh, we did is uh, uh, we uh, we estimate the full likelihood here. And uh, then uh, if we want to use it uh, in uh, a downstream task, for example, just estimate the 3D pose, uh, we can select uh, just the mode of the predictive distribution. And we see that it is really extremely simple to get the mode using the uh, model that we're going to use. And uh, we will show that uh, such a prediction, even if we want just one uh, output from our network, that it really competes uh, very well with the state of the app. So if we want, we can also uh, fit uh, two D key points. So we can add uh, to our uh, uh, logarithmic uh, log likelihood, a reprojection loss to the two D key points. And we can do that uh, really at uh, 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 test time, as I will show you later. Uh, so you can really just uh, take uh, the full probability distribution uh, without recomputing your uh, probability prediction and just add the reprojection loss and minimize. Uh, you can do also multiple uh, view refinements by taking uh, all predictions from all possible views and just uh, enforce uh, a cross view uh, consistency in whatever geometric form you want. So we have uh, uh, we have three different options for uh, downstream applications, and uh, like uh, just have one estimate, which is the mode computation, uh, fit the reprojection loss, which is really if you look at it, uh, we. This is a pro log likelihood. And if, you, if your reprojection loss uh, is a Gaussian function, uh, it is again the really the fusion between the log likelihood of uh, the pose given the image plus uh, uh, the log likelihood of uh, the pose given the 2D key point, the annotated 2D key points. And the last one uh, is uh, with a term which uh, really uh, enforces the invariance of uh, the pose, really the pose as a canonical pose across several views. So let's see how we have built this. Uh, so uh, we take an image and uh, as usually you take uh, also as in HMR, you take an encoder uh, and you get a vector here, C, uh, which has a uh, quite uh, uh, much information about the image. So, and uh, this uh, uh, vector C uh, is uh, input uh, as a condition uh, to a normalizing uh, flow network, uh, uh, which uh, uh, outputs uh, the 3D pose. We exclude, uh, as you have seen in the other uh, like in the optimization predictions, uh, we don't have only 3D pose, like your posture. We have also your shape and uh, your camera parameters. But we excluded those for a simple reason that uh, we didn't get enough diverse data in order to learn a conditional distribution of body shapes. And we're still working on that. So for the body shape itself uh, and uh, the camera pose, we just use a deterministic part, which is just a regressor. Let's uh, look uh, now closer at uh, the uh, normalizing flow. This is a conditional normalizing flow, uh, which uh, we will take some time to uh, explain next. But uh, before even explaining, the very basic idea is that you can do two things because uh, this uh, network that realizes the normalizing flow uh, is uh, invertible. So what you can do is you can sample, which means 
really sample a random number, a random vector from a Gaussian distribution. And you're going to find the corresponding pose here. And by multiple sampling, you can really do pretty much do a density estimation. But on the opposite also, if you are given a pose, uh, you invert it, you find, you find the Z, and then from the Gaussian distribution of the Z, you can find immediately the probability of this pose. So let's see a few things about the normalizing flows. Uh, I will not uh, get uh, into length uh, about this. So if you have a Z is a random variable and uh, you have a probability distribution, which in our case is uh, just uh, a Gaussian with uh, identity covariance matrix, then uh, the question is uh, if we take a function of this uh, 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 variable, what will be the probability distribution of uh, the image of this function? And uh, the main formula is that uh, uh, if you multiply it with uh, the determinant of uh, the Jacobian of uh, 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 DF uh, DZ, and you take uh, uh, the inverse. So you can do that uh, with, uh, by composing uh, several transformations. Uh, so this is like a, 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 a composition of uh, such uh, uh, functions. And in that case, if you just take the, uh, log the logarithm, uh, you see that uh, you get the minus here because of the inversion and you just get uh, the sigma of all the log depths of uh, the Jacobians of every layer. And uh, having the uh, Z to be just uh, a standard uh, multivariate uh, Gaussian, uh, it's very easy to extend it, this model to conditional densities. In our case, uh, the Y is uh, just uh, the encoding vector of the image. And uh, we can have uh, uh, the way that we build these normalizing flows is that uh, to guarantee that this F is a bijective in Z and X, and that we can really very easily invert it uh, given the condition uh, Y. Uh, so one important thing to note is that uh, the determinant of the Jacobian does not uh, depend on the Z. And uh, this means that the mode of the posterior, and this really makes things extremely simple for us, that the mode of the posterior can be directly computed uh, if uh, you just uh, put uh, for the z is equal uh, uh, zero. So if you take really the probability uh, at the peak of, the, of your uh, Gaussian. And uh, if uh, uh, also this uh, gives, uh, allows us to go and uh, have a immediate computation of uh, just a one, like of the maximum uh, likelihood uh, by just putting a zero there. So, question, yes. Question. Can you go back two slides? And then you were saying that um, all you need to do is to make sure that this function f is bijective, but how do you actually do this? Uh, this is uh, give, uh, this is on the uh, guaranteeing, but, but that uh, every composition of every function has uh, uh, a specific uh, form. Uh, it is like, uh, I have actually hidden this line. <laughs> One second. I have a slide about this. Great. I don't, oh, it's not shared anymore. Uh, do you see normalizing flows in the slide? Yes. yes. Okay. So what uh, happens uh, is uh, we follow a model called GLOW by uh, Der Kingma and Gary Wall from 2018. Uh, and it's a transformation, if I can be written as a composition of three functions, and we just have a concatenation of these uh, FIs. Uh, the first is an activation uh, uh, normalization. So F norm is an element-wise scaling and translation. 
uh, then uh, we have a linear, like an affine element, uh, where uh, we the linear transformation is parameterized with uh, the LU decomposition of the W. And then we just have a, a coupling layer. And this results at the end uh, in, a, in an FI, which is uh, invertible. So it is per, con per construction invertible. And uh, because we don't allow when we estimate, for example, W, because we estimate the LU decomposition, we really don't allow for the W to not be invertible. Right. Okay. Thanks. And uh, there are two very good tutorials. Uh, one is from Marcus Brubaker. Uh, I mean, uh, articles uh, and one from Papa Macarius, I think both of them on in PAMI. So and it's very important that it's invertible. I mean, everything is about uh, being invertible because uh, if it's not invertible, we cannot really compute uh, the likelihood because you here, if you see on the uh, second uh, row on the right, uh, you can give uh, any pose and really check, uh, given the C, how likely is this, this pose. Uh, this is uh, really uh, very powerful. And uh, for sampling, we simply sample a point from the standard Gaussian, uh, transform it using the F, and then uh, we compute uh, uh, the likelihood uh, given the equations we have shown in the previous slide. So I have heard that like um, that the good things about the invertible networks are that you can do this kind of adjective things, but maybe one of the cons are that they might be slow or I'm just curious because I actually haven't personally played around with this so much. So what was your experience and, you know, figuring out which sets of, you know, how many of these do you need and how fast is it with the trade off and everything? Uh, it's, uh, I know about the invertible networks, uh, like in other geometric problems that are very slow. No, this is a, a quite simple network and it really doesn't have, a, uh, I don't remember the number of uh, composition uh, functions. I have the paper next to me. I will check at the end of the talk. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, uh, the main problem is not on building the normalization flow. The main problem is for your data to be diverse enough to be able to produce the distribution. This is what I find is a problem here. Uh, and uh, for example, for the shape, you need uh, quite a lot of uh, data. That's why we we constrain it for the on the pose here. Quick question. Oh, so one more, just a quick well, maybe yeah. detail question. But the context vector over here in HMR, there are like 2048 dimensions, which is kind of quite a big one. Did you keep it or did you actually make it a little smaller? Same, it is the uh, same here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, and the Z is uh, 144. Thanks. So, uh, so what is the training strategy now? How we train this thing? Uh, so this is uh, the very basic uh, uh, log likelihood if you have a ground truth of the pose. Uh, this is uh, really what is the probability that we get this ground truth given this encoder. But uh, we don't have a lot of ground truths. So this is our argument and answers and from many of us, that uh, we have to deal with uh, the uh, scarcity of uh, ground truth 3D. So what do we do? We have to uh, 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 have some uh, 2D constraint. Uh, we have some priors on the theta and the beta. Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, we do here is that we want to have the expectation over all like poses of the reprojection error that results from this theta beta and p in if we have indeed the two D information. Now this expectation is quite difficult to compute. Uh, so what uh, we do is uh, there is uh, this law of the uh, Lotus, the law of the unconscious uh, statistician, uh, how to convert expectations with respect to different variables. And in this case, it uh, turns out, and I thank uh, uh, Nikos and his mathematical brilliance here and knowing everything, 
that uh, uh, we can convert this expectation over a Gaussian, the Z, uh, by taking uh, the, uh, by just uh, inserting here uh, the F function that transforms uh, the Z to the pose, and uh, the same also on the prior uh, distribution. So this is the only way to make this uh, loss uh, differentiable uh, in order to train. Uh, even though we do not have ground truth annotations to maximize their condition probability, we can still constrain the form of the output uh, distribution uh, by forcing uh, these output samples to have a low uh, reprojection error. Uh, the sampling uh, works uh, directly the same way as in the variational autoencoders by sampling from the Gaussian here. But as we mentioned, uh, our goal is uh, not only uh, 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 to uh, use it as a uh, generative model to compute uh, uh, the, this function f, uh, but uh, to use it also as uh, a predictor, uh, just to predict a single uh, pose. Uh, and uh, we can explore this property for each uh, image uh, by taking just the mode of this uh, distribution, which as we saw in the formula is by putting it uh, on the, by taking the value at the z is equal zero because the mode transforms to the mode. And that's really the elegant uh, property. And uh, uh, if we want really to do a regression, uh, we can have a loss uh, on the mode, uh, where on the mode we can still apply either a ground truth uh, 3D or the reprojection of the mode in 2D. Uh, and we can also add uh, like an adversarial uh, prior uh, about whether this is really a real uh, like a pose or not. And uh, uh, one thing to note here is that when we minimize this, uh, we don't just minimize the L mode. The L expectation, the expectation of the whole probability is uh, not redundant in the presence of L mode uh, because uh, the behavior of the mode itself uh, is not uh, indicative of the full distribution where uh, when we uh, add the expected uh, loss, the L of the expected loss, uh, then uh, we encourage uh, the distribution uh, to have uh, specific uh, properties that uh, are uh, uh, really uh, and make full use from our network here. So both are needed, even if we want to make a single prediction. Then uh, the final training strategy is uh, uh, the first loss term, if we really have ground truth, which we can just put it uh, in the, directly in the log likelihood term. The second is the expectation of all fetus, which we convert it uh, to expectation of all Zs. And the third is uh, the losses that we use for, for example, the 3D uh, error or the 2D reprojection error of the mode itself. And uh, these are, I will show you here now the power of uh, this approach. Uh, and uh, what uh, you see here, the first is really the mode that we compute. And you always uh, see the, how they fit to the 2D. And uh, this is uh, uh, the mode, which uh, would, we would keep if we would uh, need a single prediction. Uh, but uh, these are two different samples with uh, some probability mass from the same. And you see the difference here uh, that uh, the depth uh, is uh, uh, quite uh, 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 different uh, in uh, the sample here. You see it uh, here, particularly in the legs uh, with respect uh, to this, to the mode prediction. And uh, you see it also both in these cases here. Uh, and uh, uh, the different samples, pretty much all of them are consistent uh, in the camera view, which means that the model joints project to the same location, but uh, they have a much bigger depth variation. 
And uh, this is another example here, which uh, we show the pink one uh, is uh, the mode, and the other two are the samples of uh, the uh, that we get uh, from uh, the P of theta given the image. So let's uh, have a more broader look at the distribution we're computing. Uh, so this is uh, uh, if we map it back to the Gaussian and you look at this as an isotropic uh, Gaussian, uh, which means when we go from the center to the out, this is the Z uh, magnitude is increasing and the log uh, of the probability is uh, decreasing. So, and uh, you see the mode here and uh, these are different samples of the Z at these positions. And uh, you see like uh, for uh, all of them, still with uh, pre not far away from the mode, uh, most of them are consistent with actual pose. And uh, you see the differences uh, uh, to the, uh, between the samples. So this is uh, another, uh, uh, so what are, are the other properties uh, of uh, the latent space uh, Z? So we show here an example of uh, just uh, performing in the Z space. So we start from uh, Z is equal zero uh, and we pick uh, two random directions uh, among the 144 directions of the, of the Z. And then we move along these directions. So we see that moving along this direction has different effects uh, in the output pose. And uh, uh, we do this uh, without having enforced, and this might be a very good direction, without having enforced uh, any disentanglement, uh, like uh, meaningful disentanglement with respect to specific like transformations or uh, body parts in the latent space. Uh, so we continue to study uh, the learned uh, uh, distribution. I want to quantify how good is this learned uh, distribution. So what we do here is uh, we take uh, every image and uh, we produce from a single image, we produced uh, a number of samples from the Z. So from one up to 4,096 uh, samples. And then we take uh, the minimum error the minimum like the, in the joint error that we usually uh, compute. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, we see that uh, this uh, minimum joint error uh, decreases almost uh, linearly in uh, log scale. And uh, this is, uh, we have done this uh, with uh, 30,000 uh, testing uh, samples from the uh, 3.6 M uh, uh, dataset. And uh, one more like uh, proof about this. Uh, if uh, we benchmark it against uh, drawing the same number of random 3D poses from the training set distribution. And uh, it is uh, obvious that sampling from the regressed conditional distribution, which is uh, 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 in uh, the black here is significantly better uh, as a like a log likelihood shape than the naive uh, sampling from the training uh, set poses. Uh, so this uh, really are uh, show that uh, the learned distribution this way has really very good properties. And uh, the reason we study this is because uh, in addition to the downstream tasks I'm going to show you next, uh, we want also eventually to show it to use it for uncertainty estimation or even for tracking in video. So let's do now how we use it in applications. So if we want to do, for example, uh, shape model fitting, uh, then uh, uh, we will use an optimization where we should have the first term, the EJ here, uh, be analyzing the weighted 2D distance. Uh, we would use the NE theta here uh, as a mixture of uh, Gaussian 3D pose priors. And uh, the alpha is a prior for, uh, that we usually use for uh, elbows and knees, and beta is a quadratic penalty on the shape coefficients. 
And in this case, what we're going to do, if we want to, this is a classic body model fitting. In this case, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to replace the theta and the alpha term with just the log likelihood of uh, our approach. And then the final optimization becomes really the minus log likelihood of our approach uh, plus the reprojection error j. Uh, and uh, uh, in the experiments, uh, we're going to show that by using this learned uh, image-based prior, we are able to consistently improve uh, uh, fitting results, both uh, quantitatively and uh, in the 3D metrics. And we have here uh, 2D, we show the 2D joints from open pose. Uh, with uh, uh, pink color, we denote the output of the regression. We green the output of uh, our fitting method. And we gray the output after applying just a basic vanilla simplify on top of the regression, like uh, the same way we would do it in, in spin. And we show the alignment in all three cases. <clears throat> and uh, we show also the side view. So, and uh, overall, our method produces uh, very, so our method is really uh, the second and the third column. Uh, and uh, uh, we can see that uh, overall, uh, we produce very realistic reconstructions. And uh, in uh, particularly in cases where uh, we might uh, miss joints, like in the <coughs> uh, last uh, row, uh, we get a, a very good, uh, like, uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, three-dimensional reconstruction here. So this is uh, on a video, which is uh, a single-frame video. This is uh, not, uh, there is no, no smoothing uh, shown here. Uh, this is produced uh, with... Uh, uh, the notebook that uh, Nikos has made, and I really urge you to train uh, in uh, as a cross view constraint in addition to the summation of the log likelihoods of every view. And uh, this is uh, uh, what we have uh, the, the, the reconstruction of each camera view using the mode. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the pose after the refinement. So these are the quantitative comparisons in both the 3D pose regression and uh, the model fitting. In the 3D pose regression, we do at least, we do uh, it's pretty much the same as the spin and the multiple hypothesis network. And uh, in the model fitting, uh, we are improving uh, with uh, respect uh, to uh, the spin uh, simplify and the spin uh, AFT, EFT frameworks. So going forward, and uh, this is a video that I produced just by myself uh, a few days ago. Uh, we, we have several still effects because we don't enforce any smoothing. These are two subsequent frames, and you see how uh, suddenly the left and right were really just switched based on a wrong uh, open pose. Uh, if we build it uh, as part of a network where we have uh, the full log likelihood and we use it uh, as a measurement likelihood and we have a motion prediction model or just a smoothness prediction, uh, smoothness based prediction, then we can really eliminate uh, such, uh, we can deal with such errors of the open pose itself. Uh, so, as a future direction uh, in the humans, uh, we have to go beyond single humans, incorporate objects in motion, uh, reason about the other humans, and uh, reason also about the whole environment. And uh, also being able to predict what will happen in the future. So I'm gonna close just uh, with uh, there are several other approaches that are really dealing with uh, these uh, open challenges. And uh, uh, we have an initial results at CVPR 2020 about the multiple humans uh, still uh, in uh, single frames. I think the way from now on is really to deal with a video 
uh, video inherently needs uh, filtering. And I think with the probabilistic approach, we really uh, support this filtering. I'm going to use five more minutes uh, to show our, uh, it might be a little more, to show our results on a much uh, um, like a, a more like an exotic uh, setup, which is the setup uh, of, uh, of birds. Um, at Penn, we are collaborating with neuroscientists to build uh, what we call the smart uh, aviary. Uh, this is an aviary where neuroscientists study the behavior of birds 24-7 uh, over all seasons. Uh, they ablate the brain of the, uh, not the, the brain of the actual bird. So we talk about network ablations. The neuroscience are really ablating the actual brain of the bird and they put it back uh, in the aviary in order to study their behavior. And uh, we quite soon, we're going to have also neural recorders on uh, the, uh, on the brains of those uh, cowbirds. And uh, this is a, a joint uh, work uh, with uh, really a lot of people with collaboration with uh, my, the main lead is Mark Schmidt on the right. He's a neuroscientist in the biology department. And uh, uh, Bernd, my postdoc, uh, has built uh, this amazing uh, like uh, uh, setup of cameras, uh, 28 cameras, 24 microphones, and uh, all uh, uh, this uh, like uh, pretty much uh, uh, target-based calibration so that we can be able by just uh, clicking a button to calibrate uh, the cameras at any time. So we get a moment-to-moment, -moment, uh, the, the goal is really to get moment-to-moment -moment behavioral understanding over time scales over several months uh, during the day, uh, early day from dusk uh, till dawn, and uh, to be able to capture both the individual behavior of every bird, as well as the social behavior of uh, uh, these birds. And uh, there is a lot of work recently, uh, not only from uh, like uh, uh, in computer vision community, like uh, Sylvia's work, but a lot among neuroscientists on providing frameworks for tracking. And uh, the vast majority of those are based on semantic uh, key points. So you click really on key points and you track in 2D or even recently in the 3D using the deep love that. In our case, we are very uh, interested, not uh, just on the tracking of the key points, but really on the tracking of the full 3D shape because it provides a much richer signal for uh, predicting uh, the behavior of a bird. The, ideally, we really want to predict what will come next in the interaction uh, between uh, these uh, birds and these environments. And uh, computer vision-wise, uh, this is, has a very large appearance variation. Uh, we have uh, both appearance variation because of the shadows, because of the viewpoints, because of the time of the day, and because also of different uh, seasons and uh, really the position of the sun with respect to the aviary. And we really wanted to do it as natural as possible. We didn't choose an indoor environment to do this. So we uh, start with building a data set where you can find uh, 6,000 uh, frames with uh, uh, semi-automatic annotation of the silhouettes of the birds, uh, as well as uh, uh, annotation of 12 uh, key points over 1,000 uh, instances. And uh, the very first paper at the CV2020 was really to build uh, a model of the birds by using multi-view optimization. There is absolutely no ground truth in terms of a computer tomography here. And there is no ground truth in terms of a uh, like toy animal. Uh, we just uh, use the multiple views as a constraint to build uh, uh, this model. It's very difficult to build an articulated uh, model. So it is really a, a mesh uh, that uh, can uh, still capture as many postures of the bird uh, uh, as possible. And this was really plane optimization, like the one that I described at the beginning of my talk. The problem is that uh, 
in a lot of uh, in a, in, a, in a lot of situations uh, uh, many birds are visible pretty much only from one view this might be because of the position of the cameras but also because we have several like staff uh, uh, in uh, uh, a lot of stuff uh, in the ADR in terms of like uh, poles for the animals to perch and so on. So it, although we want to get rid of the uh, single frame perspective, uh, we, we chose the right multiple views in order to build the model. But then uh, for 24 seven operation, we really have to deal with single frame the way we did with humans. And uh, uh, we, uh, in our CVPR 2021 paper, uh, we followed uh, a very similar pipeline uh, that we follow for the humans, that we start from key points and uh, masks, and uh, we do a regression on the pose uh, and the shape uh, by using uh, pretty much uh, uh, a very similar thing that like a simple, which is a PCA in the shape coefficients uh, of uh, uh, the mesh. And in this case, the, the, this uh, shape coefficients are, uh, uh, the, the shape space is really on the coordinates of the mesh itself. So uh, this is uh, the optimization. Uh, we can do that uh, in a single uh, view. We can still do optimization in the multiple views, but the main goal of this paper was really the single view so that we extend it beyond the aviary and we can do it for a lot of other uh, birds. So these are qualitative fits uh, in the uh, aviary of several poses. And uh, so we can uh, uh, we uh, uh, see several actually examples of uh, quite a good fit, but uh, quite a really big ambiguity uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, depth because of the frontal view. And uh, uh, in several others uh, where we can really see also behavioral effects, like in this one where the bird is posting. Uh, and uh, we have a lot like of uh, puffed uh, postures like the previous one, uh, or stretched uh, or really asymmetric uh, like uh, postures of the bird. And uh, the estimates are, uh, uh, we, we don't have a ground truth. That's the other thing. We don't have 3.6M or uh, any of the other uh, uh, data sets we have with humans. So our only ground truth here is the cross view validation. And uh, we generalize it to the cab uh, 200 uh, data set. Uh, so then that was uh, our main insight that uh, we can really capture shapes by using a broader uh, bird collection. Uh, and uh, our main insight here was that uh, when we capture uh, like, uh, this is like more like semantic reconstruction not cross view reconstruction, like from the same bird from several images that they are in CAP 200. And uh, we follow exactly the same pipeline, like uh, alignment and uh, global rigid transformation. And then we want to have one deformation, which is uh, the uh, intra-species deformation. Uh, and uh, one deformation, which is really the instance deformation of uh, the particular like uh, pose. And by finding this, uh, this is really this, the first deformation and the second one here on the shape coefficients. And uh, what uh, we uh, really found with this uh, morphable model using uh, uh, the principal components is that when we use really like uh, a quite big variety of birds that we have an affinity of these birds in the uh, uh, in uh, the, uh, the, 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 the distances uh, between uh, uh, these birds, uh, if we plot them uh, in a lower dimensional space, like with UMAP, they really correlate uh, very well with a phylogenetic tree. Uh, and uh, as opposed to 
just uh, shape descriptors that what uh, or descriptors that we might get from uh, two dimensional. Uh, so we show here specific instances and uh, like of uh, of uh, of pairs that are really very close to each other. And uh, they're corresponding to the images. And uh, we see also that uh, uh, we have a full trees that are lie together, uh, subtrees in the phylogenetic tree. And uh, we also did the same with the ResNet 50 output uh, embedding. And uh, we saw that uh, this really doesn't show at all the same consistency as our 3D shape coefficients. I think I'm going to finish here with a two minutes uh, delay. Uh, I have given many other talks uh, on equivariants and uh, geometry where representations. Uh, and uh, uh, you can, there are also some of them in YouTube and might be, I hope that some that 3DGV uh, will continue and some point we can come back with different topics. But uh, from this uh, talk, uh, I have uh, really uh, uh, two or three main messages. Uh, do not forget model-based optimization, uh, and you can really put it as part of your deep learning pipeline. And uh, optimization can benefit in the initialization from your regression output, and the regression can benefit from your optimization using additional, more accurate ground truths. Uh, optimization, we use it also in birds. Uh, even just to build models when you don't have, there is nothing you can do when you don't have enough like a ground truth 3D examples. The second is really to embrace the uncertainty, uh, uh, single frames, but not only, even multiple frames uh, have a lot of ambiguities uh, based on depth, purely geometric ambiguity or based on occlusions. And uh, we, provided a, like a foundational approach on how to deal with these ambiguities using normalizing flow. This is our pro HMR. And such probabilistic approaches really facilitate filtering in video. And this is what we really have to do next. And uh, uh, they can also uh, help uh, in uh, prediction uh, where uh, other people have already used, for example, VAE. And uh, beyond the birds and the single humans, I think in terms of an application, we have to deal with multiple people, animals and uh, moving objects and uh, how to predict their actions. And I think uh, I will finish here Great. By, by thanking our sponsor and thanking also 3DGV is probably the best thing during the pandemic, really. I mean, uh, also waiting for the next talk uh, every week. I really want to thank the people who started it. And uh, this is really something that uh, one of the very few things, except like uh, new Netflix stuff that we're looking forward during the pandemic. Congratulations for that. Thank and you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk, Kostas. All right. Okay. So we have some questions from the audience that maybe we can, from the YouTube that I'd like to start with. Um, okay. So the first question is by Sinchen. Uh, can the probability of theta i in the pro HMR be capture multimodal distribution? Yes. Uh, I, I, have, uh, I have bothered Nikos uh, multiple times about that. And uh, indeed, uh, I mean, uh, uh, indeed, it can capture uh, other like uh, uh, like uh, local maxima. Uh, so it is per definition the way the f is composed. Uh, it's uh, uh, not a like a single uh, like mode thing, uh, and uh, but we. Uh, it's difficult uh, with uh, to find uh, a lower dimension where we can plot and find. So we 
Uh, right now, most of the stuff uh, we have been doing is really exhaustive sampling. We hope we can come with an example where we have uh, like three places with clear probability, with good probability mass and others where we don't have one. This is really a very good question in general. Uh, there have been several people arguing against normalizing flows for like uh, detecting uh, multiple modes or detecting uh, even outliers. Uh, there are such papers and there is a discussion about this in the community, not in the computer vision community. Yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, one more question from Chi Sing. Um, regarding the human representation, do you think skeletal muscle representation will be important in some scenarios over simple? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, simple is simple. And uh, I think uh, there is a very open uh, room for, uh, I have been discussing with a lot of like uh, biomechanics people uh, and uh, people who deal a lot like with observing more details uh, in like the back of people, like in rehabilitation, and uh, definitely, I guess, uh, for uh, cinematography, etc., for movies. I mean, I think this is a very open space. Um, I, I just didn't have the time. I think uh, anybody who will come with a more detailed, like a muscle model, uh, will definitely, there are cases where you can show that it will be superior. Great, yeah, that's true. Oh, okay, well, one more follow up on this, which is that how do you think um, we should bridge the gap between closed humans and simple, or is this gap critical at all? Oh my God, I should have Michael Black here um, <laughs> to answer these questions. Um, I really uh, don't, uh, I. I think I'm gonna skip this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If if if, if uh, anybody from Michael group or even if George is in the audience, uh, please uh, or Nikos, please go ahead and or Anju yourself. <laughs> I'm leaving close to George. So, well, <laughs> no, I think close is important. Uh, the appearance is better for more close capture, but I think there are two different goals. I'm not sure. Maybe the panelists have some. I want to open up to panelists. Yes, the questions or follow-ups. Well, I can just jump into on the closed human question. So just to remind me how much efforts uh, Michael Black's group put into the uh, simple model. I really have a unified representation for naked body with the pose and uh, and the shape, and even the pose corrected uh, pose uh, shape, right? There's there's a lot of engineering efforts and from data capture modeling and everything. And now with this, uh, what cost has called foundation model for humans. So we end up with this, but think about close. Well, the topology variation is, is significant, but it is also possible to build sort of a mixture of models about growth. Maybe that require more engineer efforts than the naked body, but some are gonna do it, I guess. But then they then they extend to shoes and maybe hairs as well. Yeah. I think so, I mean uh, I thought I, it is more uh, I would call it not so much foundational for humans. What we present it can be used also in objects. Uh, we and you saw we excluded the shape. Actually, we cannot really generalize it to everything uh, in our uh, probabilistic model. So I would uh, uh, it is as if uh, is a foundation to start in a direction and more. I think it will be more promising for video than for including clothes or hands or. Uh, or shoes or hair. Yeah, 
the shape not being accurate is a big problem. And I think there are some works, but um, it's to be desired. And I think that might be where you might need clues because if you want to use analysis by synthesis, then you also need to be able to minimize the appearance. But then at the same time, I'm also not so sure about going like full on like a parametric model of clothes. So I think it's a, it's a really big question. Um, okay, so let's open up the uh, other questions from the panel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Sylvia. Uh, oh, then um, congratulations for the for this work. And um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I actually a uh, very long time ago we we had a paper on uh, um, optimization and uh, proposed estimation in two D, uh, where we were looking for not just the uh, maximum a posteriori um, solution, but uh, a set of diverse um uh, solutions uh in order to capture multimodal this multimodal distribution and having actually diversity in the in mm. the in that solution so i so um my question is uh, how can you think of um actually uh, selecting a, cert a certain degree of diversity in the in your in your solution um because um yeah, can you control the? the yes, 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 that's a very, that, that, that's that's a very very good uh, point, uh, and uh, how uh, this is really uh, uh, trying to not get a very sharp uh, like uh, distribution. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the uh, if you the way we formulated here, you don't want to start from a Gaussian with uh, a sigma equal the identity and uh, go to as a result to get a Gaussian with a minimum sigma and look uh, everything looks concentrated in the middle mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there are several ways to uh, right now we don't do anything uh, we just let the, the, the data uh, like uh, work on it and uh, based just on the fact that it is in the, the transformation we get uh, from the Z to the poles is uh, invertible. Uh, this uh, somehow uh, like uh, uh, guarantees some expansion of the, uh, of the distribution, but there are in generative approach in general, there are approaches where you want to force uh, the resulting distribution to have uh, like a bigger uh, variance, for example. Uh, but uh, we didn't enforce uh, anything like this. Uh, the only, uh, our only way right now, it is really empirical. And uh, you can see that uh, um, we always have a term when we train, we always have a term uh, that uh, we train based uh, on additional information, not uh, just uh, the ground truth. And the reason we have included all these terms is really to be able to get uh, more conditions mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to really uh, uh, con expand uh, uh, this uh, conditional probability. It might be that if we had very, very high I think we had uh, such plots, but if we had uh, just the ground truth for 3D, might be Nik Nikos can step in if he, he I, but I think he's working. Um, might be with uh, just the ground truth and without the 2D, might be we didn't have as diverse conditional as now. Uh, we have to compare this. This is a very good question. And uh, sorry for not citing her uh, in the talk. We have it in the paper for not citing your work. Oh, no worries. I think the title of our paper was a bit, a bit uh, obscure, so <laughs> it didn't get the attention <laughs> that I think uh, um, uh, could have had. Uh, can I ask another question? Do you still have time? Um, so I have, actually I have a lot of questions, but maybe. Um, so if you if you could ask my, yeah, I, I guess maybe um, this has been touched a little bit before. If you could ask Michael Black to add something to the simple model, what would you ask for? 
uh, but uh, um, without looking at the clothing and hair. Uh, but do you think, um, um, so we, we, we mostly have adult uh, models. We don't have models that have, I don't know, like uh, um, teenagers, um, old people, uh, both in terms of shape and pose. But I guess for the for many applications, it would be interesting to have uh, this uh, shape space and this uh, pose space uh, a little bit uh, more, um, you know, with some semantic labels about the uh, the characteristic of, of the person. Would that be interesting for for you? Do you think? Uh, yes. So uh, I I can tell you that uh, I was. Thanks to brilliant students like uh, Georgios and uh, Nikos, I came into the humans. And thanks to Mark Badger and uh, I also my collaborators, we started working on the birds. Uh, and I was looking personally more as a geometric problem. And the way I see right now, the, the main use of the bodies is not really to exactly reconstruct, but uh, to have a, if you include the body, you have better constraints like uh, interpenetration. And uh, I didn't show, for example, we have a excellent approach on uh, like avoiding uh, like humans, even in like uh, by estimating their body shape, uh, avoiding robots that should avoid uh, like when we're interacting, when interacting with a human that we call it semantic planning. And uh, we saw it uh, only more like as an occupancy a constraint, the body shape, rather uh, than as uh, actual constraint for fitting like uh, clothes or, uh, or using it in uh, in Hollywood. And uh, we definitely, I think as a community, I mean, first I, for example, I haven't submitted any human work at NeurIPS, but uh, at NeurIPS, definitely uh, it would be a red flag to, if we always continue using all the same data sets that we use, which is not diverse enough for 3D for 3D human uh, mass reconstruction. So, in terms of uh, diversity uh, of uh, people, uh, this has to be definitely expanded, uh, just for the sake of diversity, and not even for the sake of uh, uh, like uh, having more visually appealing or metrically correct. Uh, reconstructions. Uh, but uh, as I said, I'm not uh, really, I mean, uh, uh, for me, I'm looking more as a, in terms of occupancy mm -hmm. uh, and more as a better, if you, if you include the shape that you also get a better pose uh, rather than for the actual uh, metric accuracy. Of course, we compare metric accuracy in the mess. Uh, uh, but uh, if uh, I don't know practically how we're gonna be on like tomographies on uh, how we can, I think that there should be a way to obtain uh, full tomographies in particularly for animals, not for for humans. Yeah, and, I think uh, then And then map uh, these canonical poses of the tomographies to other poses. I think in support to your uh, claim that 3D for, for, for animals is important, I think uh, um, like even when you analyze the behavior, like being just being able to put the eye, like locate the eyes and have a, you know, just, just maybe be able to understand what the animal is looking at. It's really, um, it's really an important uh, uh, cue that uh, maybe you can do still with 3D key points, but I, I think with a 3D uh, head, and uh, um, other other um, constraints. Um, no, no, you're you're absolutely precise. right. I mean, even the uh, even the movement of the tail, for example, or mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is uh, this uh, like uh, small uh, wing movements that uh, they do when uh, they react uh, to singing the birds, which uh, they cannot be really captured with a key point. Mm -hmm. uh, how many key points are you gonna put at the tail of a bird? in order to capture this. So this really, have, can, they can only be captured with a full 3D model 
And uh, I think uh, what we need there is probably a better uh, like articulation, which, which uh, we need some knowledge from biology to put a better articulation on the, on the birds and on many other animals, which are not like uh, quadrupeds. But do you think uh, the, the skeleton-based model would be like the, the best model for, for uh, there are a lot of animals that are very soft and they... I think, uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we have used uh, 3D models we have uh, purchased, probably they're used in Hollywood, which have some skeleton in them. Uh, this is still work to be done on how to connect uh, the skeleton with the skin or with the, with the wings in our case, which are even, is even more difficult. Our hope is that we provide right now enough, that the mesh is enough for a wide range of behaviors, mm -hmm. uh, definitely like for turning the head and so on. Uh, which would be difficult to capture for smaller birds. How many key points are you going to put, like uh, on the on the bird uh, on the bird's head? And uh, then uh, there will be definitely others, like uh, like small, like uh, uh, hitting of the wings, which probably will be very difficult to capture. Great, uh, Mark Mark Badger in his. Uh, in the animal vision workshop has shown some Netflix videos of uh, bird behavior with their wings, which is really impressive. And this really shows how open this field is. And I really uh, urge uh, more of you to work uh, on, uh, on animals uh, and uh, also to collaborate with science, like uh, working for science application is one of the most rewarding experiences you can have. Great. Thank you again for the talk and for the- Thank you for all the, thank you for all the questions. I wanted to thank again also Georgios uh, who started all the human work and uh, Nikos and uh, Mark and Yuko for the birds. Uh, Great. We still have some more, seven more time. Maybe Jimmy. Great, has... great. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy, please. Yeah, please. yeah. So I think we'll talk about a lot about models, right? The human models and the bird models or general animal models. So maybe I ask a question about another um, direction about learning. I really like your idea of where you are, your thought on this collaboration between optimization and regression. It seems so, it's some, somehow a way, it's a way for weekly certified learning to, to, to some extent. So then I would think about, what do you think about this, how we can, whether we can use a video or motion to supervise this kind of a, a post estimation or shape estimation from single frame? Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, there is one way to look, uh, uh, obviously the video is just uh, multiple views, but uh, it's, uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, motion prediction uh, work. Uh, uh, I guess you are, uh, I think your co-author in the humor, right? And uh, Anju has uh, work. Uh, I think uh, this is, uh, and uh, many, if you talk to with roboticists, uh, the single frame approach uh, is uh, really not uh, that relevant uh, because it means that uh, you see once and try to predict everything just from one frame. So video is really extremely, uh, important uh, in robotics and uh, as well as in uh, tracking humans and uh, animals. Uh, the way in the in the in the in, in the probability, it is very obvious that uh, you have, and I think you have it in the paper. In them, they have the motion prediction step where you have this integral, and in the update step, you can use directly our likelihood. Uh, in the with respect to the optimization and, uh, uh, and uh, regression, uh, there are several ways to include uh, also in the optimization, the explicitly the smoothness constraints, uh, the, your motion prediction. Um, there, are, uh, there are three, uh, two other ways to include the, the optimization. We have tried uh, one of them. So, 
One is to the constraint base to really add an optimization with a Lagrange multiplier, uh, not just as a regularization, uh, like with trying to satisfy the constraints exactly. The optimization in the loop appears also in the opnet where one of the layers itself is uh, an optimization module and you have to differentiate through this. Um, so I think in geometric problems, uh, we should uh, try all of those. Uh, what we tried is uh, uh, one of the most uh, like uh, obvious things uh, there is no excuse for not using spin. I think this is my opinion, uh, whether it's single frame frame or multiple views. Yeah, so either it's a single frame of motion, it's just optimization looks like a way to couple the 2D based constraint and then the 3D motion prior or post prior. For example, the prior from AMAS data sets, a large collection of motion camera data, yeah. and the variation of poses and motions. And then the optimization is a nice way to put together. Well, one well, you can say it's a Bayesian approach, but it's just a multiple energy term put together that can um, get a result. So that means if you want the optimization approach can generalize to really interesting dynamic motions, say Olympics, this kind of motion, gymnastics, um, like soccer mm -hmm. and sport, this kind of motion, the motion capture data set may not be enough to really represent such interesting uh, phenomenon. So then come to whether the 2D annotation could help. So we are talking, you mentioned this 2D key points and the masks as kind of a breakthrough from computation perspective using deep learning. But could you think, think about anything else that can be annotated? Include maybe 2.5D annotation that human can annotate, then help in so I mean, uh, yeah, and even uh, nobody's, uh, I mean, uh, when we do joint annotation, we automatically have uh, like a temporal correspondence, obviously, because they have an ID, uh, these key points, but uh, we could definitely, the same way that we have a, a dense pose, for example, uh, where they spent like millions to establish the data set, uh, we could have a semi-automatic annotation of uh, dense uh, pose a long time. Mm. So that that uh, would uh, be, I think uh, that would be very useful. And uh, their optical flow approaches have becoming uh, have become so uh, powerful these days. But uh, I I don't know. Probably I mean Michael's group uh, does everything so. Probably they have used optical flow already. I don't. I cannot keep up uh, on uh, on using optical flow on the body of somebody. Uh, the problem with uh, on, on the other hand, the problem with the Olympic Games and, for example, even the motion of the birds. In the motion of the birds with a 60 frames per second camera, uh, you get uh, while flying the bird is once here and then it is like 100 pixels or 200 pixels in the next frame. There is absolutely no flow there mm -hmm. or motion constraints. And I really argue that uh, for these kinds of data sets, the best way to get ground truth is high frame rate cameras or even like event based cameras uh, where you can get. Uh, and I think for sure, for biology in biological applications, they use them already. They have these high frame rate cameras to capture uh, like uh, 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 flights or uh, insects or flights or bird flights. And uh, there is, uh, I think uh, for, uh, um, for our applications, it would be good to use them and use optical flow as pretty much uh, dense correspondence. Pose, just dense correspondence, yeah. Yeah, so since that's high resolution camera definitely will help us. They also and, can solve the motion blur issues. And if in the fast motion, the blur is- Yeah, like, yeah. There are several, yeah. There are several ways now to uh, eliminate motion blur with uh, event-based cameras. And uh, I think uh, cell phones will come out with blur elimination using event-based cameras. That's yet another talk I'm giving. 
Yeah, very cool. I think probably time is up and thanks a lot for the discussion. I think it's very interesting. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting me. This is really so exciting series. Yeah, thank you, Kostas. I really, really like the pro HMR. It's one of those things, you know, when we we're working on it, we we're like, oh, we need to really do yeah. that. And then I'm really happy that now there's like a toolbox. Yeah, yeah okay. thank, uh, very nice seeing you. Uh, I like at least your faces, you three, Sylvia, Jimmy, and Andrew. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. I'm ending the stream. Okay, stream is done. Okay.